Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. A real pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Hello. Thanks so much for taking the time. Um, so I guess for fans of the books, fans of the movies, maybe you can set the scene for us a little bit. I believe 10,000 years BC, before Chalamet. Yes, <laughs> before Chalamet, book. yes. Um, we are the Harkonnen sisters and we have a very, very messed up family, a complex um, story of banishment. being banishment and vilified, humiliated, and we are, I at least, Falia Harkin and raging, and we have become the leaders of the sisterhood, which later in 10,000 years will be known as the Bene Gesserit. Um, but we are sort of fuel and anger has been channeled. Our power has been channeled and we are, when the series opens, set fair in our plan to guide humanity to peace and prosperity. And it all starts to go wrong. Mm. <laughs> and our, our sort of power divide is that my older sister runs the sisterhood and she is the sort of mother superior. Girl boss. Yes. And I am the sort of nerdy, quiet, younger sister who may or may not have been neglected and may have done some things that, you know, I find it's true to say that in I am a young sister and we watch where our big sisters go wrong and don't make those mistakes, but get up to the same naughty things, just don't get found out. Very true. Um, and I guess when you were first approached about this concept, about the idea, what was your first thought? I mean, because there's such rich source material there, but also this huge fan base, you know, and then the Denise films, so epic and grand in scale. Um, so quite a world to, to step into. So what was your first thought? Well, I think for both of us, we were, we were pretty much June virgins. And I think had we known the scope of all of that, we'd have been very intimidated but because we're just like you know actors we went in and went oh this this is a really rich feast of character and you know intrigue to get into and i think as time has gone by we've both kind of gone holy crap mm -hmm. this is you know mm -hmm. this is this is quite important to a lot of people i had a man who was came to fit my new tv and wi-fi which i can't obviously work myself um and when i said i was going to play tula harkin and he he knelt at my feet oh, wow. so I, okay i need to kind of realize the size and seriousness of what i'm getting involved in but my other feeling when i heard we were getting involved is how fantastic at last we know that there are lots of women who love sci-fi yeah. and have loved watching the future be peopled by powerful men which seems to look a little bit like the past and even the present um but how wonderful to have a story for those women that love sci-fi and they get to see themselves I mean, I hope they're not like us, obviously, because we are... We're not to um, be emulated yeah. in that way. <laughs> We're not icons of feminism in every sense, but, yeah, great to see yourself out there. And how did you approach each of your characters? I mean, you're sort of maybe there's a slight moral ambiguity to, to this uh, character. Just slightly, <laughs> maybe. Just a bit. So I, ambitious, um, so much complexity yeah. there. Yeah, I think uh, Valia Harkonnen, at a stage in her life when she's very, very powerful still, but still unformed and vulnerable, is is taken in by this sect. And a charismatic leader says to her, you're very special, you're very powerful. And that's a really dangerous thing to do to somebody because that gives you a sense of in, it, what it's very enabling and justifies the means. And it's the beginning of quite dangerous path. Emily had the brilliant idea when we were preparing for the role of going to the National Portrait Gallery and looking at portraits of Queen Elizabeth I, who was quite a mean little sister. <laughs> to, I, I think she either had her cousin or her sister beheaded uh, at one point, having written a letter saying, Dear beloved sister, this is your death warrant. So, um, yeah, we we went into what you need to do to hold on to power and family and the idea of a name that, that can condemn you uh, to be called Harkonnen. Uh, or to be called Atreides has magnificent consequences that we are playing out and we see that in life you know land wars and grudges and power over energy or spice um is dominating politics uh, as we speak and i guess like you were sort of saying there at the beginning we don't often see you know stories like this being led by you know two sisters mm. and kind of the intricacies of that dynamic of their kind of relationship to each other is really key to the show. So how did you work on, you know, having that, perhaps having sisters yourself helped you could kind of tap into some of your experiences too? I was just saying earlier, I think one of the greatest 
most powerful things in the in the in the human world is sibling rivalry, and the the force that it unleashes is huge. But because we have we have shared secrets that must not be revealed. That's our characters, not Olivia and Emily. <laughs> <Yeah. I understand. laughs> they they have they have you know they have to keep very close. Mm. But we've known each other for decades. Mm. We were at the Royal Shakespeare Company together in the early nineties. Yeah. Yes. So we have that. In a way, to share a training and a tradition in the theatre is quite like sharing a, uh, an upbringing. And uh, so we, we, and we have all that stuff in common, which means that we do actually now, after two weeks of press, finish each other's sentences or actually speak in <laughs> unison from a standing start. Occasionally we do, yeah. yes. I love it. And um, one of the things you really notice, you know, when you watch a show is just how high these production values are. And, and I love the fact that Alison was saying, you know, that it's kind of drawing from the world that Denis created in the movies. But obviously we've gone back a bit in time. So there's there's a lot of specificity that she has to draw on there, both in terms of it being this kind of grounded sci-fi look, but also kind of hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic and how the tech fits in. So what was it like being on these sets? Really so cool. I mean, the sets were breathtaking and in the depth of their design, really. But I think one of the things, the sort of culture of the world that we inhabit is very much influenced by the fact that we are close to the end, with the, the, the machine wars have end, just recently ended and the battle against AI has only been won. Humanity has just survived. And so there's this sense of, needing to develop all these scientific powers that our sect becomes brilliant at, the, you know, being able to truth sense, to tell if people are lying, being able to hack our own biology, to access our DNA, and contact our ancestors. And all of it, you know, it has a sort of pseudo-scientific basis, some of it. You know. I don't know what you mean by pseudo. Being the no. scientific system, yes. you know. <laughs> obviously, my, I, have the love, I have the loveliest set with the... You know, I'm an actor. I didn't do well in science, but I can pretend to be good at science. So I have all lovely bottles full of coloured water and microscopes and things with yeah. scientific instruments and can look like I know what I'm talking about, which is an uh, actor's dream. It is. <laughs> and I guess like the best of sci-fi, you know, you can watch it on one level, which is, you know, be immersed in this other world, the entertainment value of it all. But there's also so much that's philosophical and existential there about these kind of battles for power, the future of mankind. What we're talking about in this series, uh, I don't think this is a spoiler, the, because it comes up so much in Frank Herbert's original novels, the idea of fear as something you can catch and can control you and that you can overcome through your body. And now we're finding out that your microbiome and your gut bacteria can control your mood, whether you're depressed or whether you feel uh, in, uh, you know, that, that you're... I, I read something the other day that cheese dreams aren't, aren't uh, uh, just a myth, that there is bacteria in cheese that makes you hallucinate. And... All this stuff is now coming to be shown to be true and not just uh, old wives' tales. So there's a lot to be taken. I think that people think shows like this, there's a lot that can chime with our contemporary world. Indeed. Absolutely. And, and um, an epidemic that can make you depressed or mm. can disempower you. And, uh, you know... The, one of the other powers, the truth sense power, is also really interesting because... We can, we can tell if people are lying, but we use the commodity of truth to manipulate, mm. um, which is, you know, in terms of where we are and facing, you know, political situations around the world, that's a very strong influence. And using fear to persuade entire populations to behave or indeed vote a certain way. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing all that with me. Huge congratulations on the show. Thank Can't you very much. Very nice to see June Prophecy. Thanks so much. Thank you.